My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, we poke around the accursed Castle Wittgenstein to find the monster and Margrita as we revisit Death on the Right. Our first segment is the basic crawl. Death on the Reich is an adventure for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 1st Edition, originally published in 1987 as a box set. It is part of the Enemy Within campaign, following directly on from Shadows Over Bogenhofen. It was written by Phil Gallagher, Jim Bambra, and Graham Davis, with cover art by Ian Miller, maps and diagrams by Charles Elliott, and interior illustrations by Martin McKenna. We are reviewing the 126-page softcover book version put out by Hogshead Publishing in 1996, and its PDF equivalent published by Cubicle 7 in 2017. In this second episode on Death on the Reich, we will be covering the sections about the village of Wittgendorf and its nearby Castle von Wittgenstein. That's pages 45 to 86. What do those sections contain? Well... They begin with an overview of the von Wittgenstein family, the local nobles and their history, the barony of Wittgenstein, and then the town of Wittgendorf. This includes some events and descriptions of fixed locations. The events occur over three days after the PCs arrive, beginning with an episode entitled The Pale Lady, in which the local noble, Margrethe von Wittgenstein, comes down to the village uh, with an entourage of her constantly faceless armoured guards and seizes a villager to take away for her grisly experiments. On the same day, they also encounter the Dog and Bone Man, and they also encounter the Watcher, who later turns out to be sinister local physician Jean Rousseau. Day two, they encounter the Child in Need, who, let's just say, is a spider baby. Then there is the Two-Headed Sheep, and their boat gets impounded by the local constabulary. And on day three, we have Three Pints and Three Straws, uh, one of the all-time classic pub encounters in a fantasy game, and then the Outlaw's Spy, in which the PCs gain a new potential ally. The next section is about the Outlaw Camp and Sigrid and her outlaws. They are a band of bandits, as the title suggests, who are hiding out in the woods, but ready to strike at the Wittgensteins and their entourage. Next, we move on to details of Castle Wittgenstein and, crucially, how to get into it. The default way to get in is the Outlaw Attack, which leads into the Under the Castle section, featuring area encounters and some events. Or you could go uh, the frontal way, encountering the castle guards and entering the castle, although this is mostly actually rules for remaining undetected while sneaking around if you manage to... uh, come in through a secret entrance. Next comes the actual detailed description of Castle Wittgenstein. We start with the Outer Bailey, which has some mutant beggars and lots of guards. The Guard Tower, which is located between the two drawbridges linking the Inner and Outer Bailey. Then we have the Inner Bailey, featuring a creepy butler, a dining hall, weird cats, a taxidermy room, Marguerite von Wittgenstein's very Frankenstein-y experiment tower, and more. Then we have the dungeons, featuring cells, an ochre guard, a torture chamber, and the hidden warpstone room you came here for, also the trigger for the destruction of the castle. Finally, we wrap up with a section on experience point awards. Let's talk about how we have used this in our games, Tom. Well, I ran Death on the Reich in its entirety uh, using Wolfram 1st Edition. That took us 17 two-hour sessions, and we spent about five of those, five or six perhaps, in Wittgendorf and the castle itself. Uh, I've only read it, um, but uh, yeah, it's what a read. (laughs) Um, So first of all, before we begin, listeners, and maybe even before you go read this part of the module, all of the content warnings, if there's anything that you might be triggered by it is almost certainly in this part of the module so all the content warnings what do you think tom is that fair um now now that you mention it yes yes it's definitely fair (laughs) uh things we liked about this module holy shit how come no one told me how good this module was going to get it is so freaking good in this part I I loved every part of it. I, I The shackles of our format require me to say with more specificity what I loved about it. I'll start with, this is true horror. Here's what I mean by that. So the module wears its classic horror references like 
pretty much on its sleeve, right? It's pretty obvious stuff. You've got, there's Frankenstein, there's Phantom of the Opera, there's Elizabeth Bowery, there's uh, Dracula. You've got all that stuff, right? And what I love about it is this module feels like what it would be like if those classic representations of, say, Frankenstein or whatever were not sanitized in any way, <laughs> right? Like if you, if, you, if you were to take the sort of like implied horror and push it all to the front, I think you would get Castle Wittgenstein and Wittgendorf. It reminds me a little bit of when we covered Carcosa, you remember that I said Carcosa is like if Masters of the Universe was not put together to advertise toys, right? You would, you would have Carcosa at the end. This is a similar thing. If you were to take the classic universal monster pictures and create them in a way that was not for a sort of censorious 1950s uh, sensibility, you, you would have this. It's so terrifying. It's so bleak. It's so ghoulish. Unlike other horror OSR things we've covered, which tend to have like some alien weirdness or gonzo-ness. Like, this doesn't have that. This is just straight up fucking terrifying and and grotesque and ghoulish. And it, honestly, when I was reading parts of it, I was profoundly uncomfortable. Like, I was, there were certain parts I was reading where I, I was just, it was creeping me the fuck out. And, um, but I loved every minute of it. Yeah, you're right. It's it's insanely bleak, isn't it? This is a, a village and the castle inhabitants, although it's their fault, so you care about them less. But this whole community is just on the way down. They've got, like, maybe, by the time the PCs arrive, they've got maybe weeks to, to survive, probably. And it's, it's yeah, just the sense of decay and hopelessness is is just everywhere, in every encounter, except for maybe, like, the one bit in the Temple of Sigmar where everything hasn't gone completely to pieces. And the fact that everyone's just kind of living with it is also, I think, quite true to life, but also very depressing. It's terrifying in its way, right? Like, the, the I mean, I, I have a... Gosh, I had like a huge list of like 20 examples of this, but I'll try to just think of a few here for purposes of our discussion. The dog in the bone man scene, where basically there is a dog uh, and a man fighting over a bone. And that scene, the way it content, massive content warnings for animal cruelty and stuff here, folks, the way that scene plays out, whereby if like if the man wins, like he eats the dog, if the dog wins, the dog's mates come and they eat the man and like, and maybe the villagers come and eat all of them. Like it's so, it's so grim and you're, you're just skin crawling the way it's described. And one point in the castle, you can talk to these servants in the kitchen and there's this one servant who has a copper wire tied around his neck. And whenever the sergeant on an upper floor wants something from the servants, he pulls that wire and it throttles the guy with the copper wire around his neck. And that man's like desperate, like gasping and screaming is what alerts the servants that the sergeant wants attention. Like it's that kind of thing, right? Like it's, it's, it's really uncomfortable. The description of the village ghouls who are not supernatural ghouls, but they behave like ghouls. They eat bodies. They, they, they're they're gradually becoming more feral. Like it's it's um it's a lot, but it's really good. Yeah, and I should, and it's not entirely a downer either. It's actually quite fun to play. That's the weird thing as well. It's very black humor, and there are some NPCs that, if you're the GM, are just just really good to play. Like um. Well, Ludwig, I'm sure is what you're is one of them, right? Well, let, we'll get to Ludwig later, but yeah, yes. Uh, but also, like, there's the the doctor's housekeeper who is uh, I think she's called Frau Blucher, uh, which is a, yes, yeah, cla which I think in the 80s was harder to know that was a reference to Young Frankenstein. But she's the classic like hard of hearing housekeeper who keeps misunderstanding and misconstruing what the PCs say to her. Now that's a very old joke, but it's still funny and it's still amusing every single time. And this feels like like the limited amount that I know about Warhammer, like this feels like that to me. Like this feels like everything that people have told me about Warhammer, right? I mean, this sort of mixing of the black gallows humor with like this kind of really just awfulness, right? Um, feels very trademark. And what I love about that that um, that somewhat comedic uh, moment with uh, with Frau Bruca is her master Jean Rousseau, and actually a number of the characters in the setting his face is literally putrefying away and he has to use makeup or to, to, to cover it. Right. This, this ongoing motif of 
people whose faces are decaying uh, and them having to cover it with masks and things is is so good and so thematically on point. And um, every time I read a description of one, it never got less horrifying. <laughs> it always it always maintained its power. Yeah, and, and it's really good in a way because it's taken something that's in the Warhammer first edition rulebook. They sort of mention kind of offhand that one of the penalties for learning necromancy is you start to get a corpse-like appearance. But it's kind of dashed off and no one had really... You would read it and not think much of it. But then here, it suddenly becomes a thing that's, that, like you said, a motif. and Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, and I think that's what I love about the whole thing. It's, it's kind of what I was saying earlier. Like, the sort of thing that would... It's the kind of stuff that would get glossed over, you know, in another context. But here, it's just really brought to the forefront. And you're, you're kind of forced to face the true, awful, horrifying nature of what's going on, right? So, I really love that. I, li- I like when fantasy embraces the fundamental grotesqueness of of its uh, of its genre trappings right why don't you do one now what do you, what do you like about it uh well i mean let's let's revisit the the npcs there so i enjoyed uh the chaos warrior who has his who's staying at the castle and kind of wants margaret von wittgenstein's help for his chaos warband but is prepared to kind of stab her in the back if need be because you know chaos so he was an interesting one to have the PCs encounter and exactly how we can talk about it in a bit. Slurred the butler, who I obviously played in that sort of slightly unctuous "Can I help you, sir?" sort of uh, sort of way at all times, and kept mentioning that he was hiding one of his hands because it's it's secretly a claw. And uh, the prisoner who's got to Stockholm syndrome with the ogre torturer, yes, yeah, and that he just he's sitting in a kind of gibbet hanging up in the torture room. He he just freaked the players out, and they were like. Well, we'd like to help him, but he's too weird and scary. We're going to go, and they just they just got out, got the hell out of there. But I think the name plus ultra of all the NPCs in Castle Wittgenstein is Ludwig. Is Ludwig the nicest giant cockroach in the world? So he is he uh, is I think he is the head of the Wittgenstein family, or he would be, but he's kind of retired himself to seclusion. He's the nominal head, yeah. right? But his mutations uh, he started out looking human, and he gradually just turned into a big bug, uh, Kafka style. And so he now uh, just sort of sits in his tower all day uh, with a kind of a retinue of thousands of giant other cockroaches, but not, you know, intelligent ones. And he plays the harpsichord and he's actually, he's quite nice. And you can tell that the writers of the, of Death on the Right loved him as much as I did because they have a bit in the text where if the PCs aren't brave enough to go up to where the harpsichord is, he comes down to, oh, hello. Um, And in fact, uh, our group, they kind of saw all the cockroaches downstairs and they were like, nope. And didn't bother. So, and then I was thinking, ah, oh, this is railroady, but they have to meet Ludwig. So after they'd set the castle on fire, I had him come out into the courtyard to warn everyone that it was on fire. <laughs> and then they made friends with him, and they took him away on their boat, and they kind of uh, enacted a plan to, despite the fact that he's a giant chaos mutant, to try and let him live out his dream of seeing the opera in the city of Middenheim. Um, yeah, Ludwig is just amazing, and he wears he wears little glasses perched on his uh, and a powdered under- wig <laughs> and a powdered wig. Like, yeah, he's great. I love the Ludwig encounter as well, and and again, we're making it sound like it's very charming, and it is. He seems like a charming character, the one friendly character in the whole castle, yeah. as I can tell. And and yet he's a big fucking cockroach. And to get to him, to even interact with him, you have to walk on this disgusting carpet of thousands of cockroaches, right? Like that is gross and scary, right? Like it's it's this back and forth that the module does, which I think is really, really good, um, balancing the kind of the humor with the horror. Um, although in my opinion, horror outweighs it significantly. I think I would say it does. Um well, the other thing about Ludwig, of course, is he's the payoff to the rumors and news events that we had, you know, maybe a dozen sessions earlier at the beginning mm. of this scenario where um it was basically the the empire has outlawed uh, lynching people just for having mutations like they're they're tolerated now and so like if you've this is the, i guess is the the ultimate test of how mutant a mutant are you prepared to say is okay and it turns out um that much uh, in the case of our group and i guess some other groups might just see him and uh react more violently who knows the Ludwig conversation is actually a great segue into another thing that I really enjoyed about the module, which is this module has some really amazing set pieces in it. Mm. Um, the the Ludwig encounter is one of them, just the, the, the harpsichord music and the, and the carpet of cockroaches and this giant cockroach wearing a powdered wig. Like, that's a beautiful 
fantastic, awful, gross, lovely set piece, right? Like, it's wonderful. It's got s- several big set pieces like that where they feel like moments, you know? Like, it's not just, like, a little one-off thing. This feels like an important, cool moment. And, and this module's loaded with them. Uh, the Temple of Slanesh scene, which um, I was wondering if there was some coded homophobia going on there, but I, I felt like maybe that was a reach, and so I let it go. That whole scene with these sort of, like decadent uh you know revelers in this temple it's really really good there's this scene with these villagers who believe that crossing the drawbridge into the inner bailey to be with uh margarita wittgenstein that to to go with it like like that's a salvation you know like like they 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 treat it like this like it's this almost religious kind of thing like they believe that if they're able to ever cross the drawbridge then all their troubles will go away but of course as players we know that's not true right we know that they're gonna die probably like it just has so many amazing set pieces Uh, my favorite is probably is what we're going to talk about in the expert delve is the um is the dinner with jean rousseau and um and lady marguerite like just uh so many good things yeah one of the set pieces that i like is there's a whole sort of mini not a mini dungeon but a little section on the temple of sigmar that's peripheral to the village now largely in ruins except for the sanctuary and and underneath it or in the nearby cemetery is where the quote-unquote ghouls live but there's a whole bit in there where if you go in and you read the holy book that's on the altar and you intone the words there um, forthrightly, it, there's a chance that one or more of the player characters will get this vision from the god Sigma. And it's really interesting because it's obviously it's a little bit of refuge from the bleakness outside, but it also adds this mythical element to everything that's going on. Uh, which is is interesting and I think valuable because there's always a danger with Warhammer that it may just turn into Renaissance Germany, but there are some mutants. And this is something that kind of r- reminds you that you're playing in a world that's a little bit different, that has these these sort of Greek-style polytheistic uh, gods going on. And uh, I mean, and the, the best thing, of course, is there's there's like a magic sword that can be had once you've got this blessing and there's also a high, quite a high likelihood you're just going to lose it immediately because all sorts of bad things can happen in the near future. But yeah, that was really good for providing contrast, basically, taking you out of the squalor of Wittgendorf and putting you somewhere nice and restful and, and safe for a while. And then, of course, throwing you right back into it as you go down and explore the crypt or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, the last thing I'm going to say about things that I really liked is it's a big picture thing, but I'll tell you what. The whole module uh, A makes a lot more sense now <laughs> because when when we covered the first part, I only read the first part. I didn't read this part, and I thought, oh, okay, well, this is like you know, it's an interesting little river boat, you know, journey, you know, going up the river, selling your wares, dealing with taxmen, maybe getting getting into some fights with some boring monsters. Like it, like it was that kind of that was my general feeling on it. But then this part happens and it all kind of ties together. It all makes sense. Like now I look at the whole thing in total, the full sweep of it. And it's obvious that the first part is really kind of, it's almost like a bait and switch or it's like a, or it's like, it's like setting the table to just like wreck it. Right. (laughs) You know, like it's that kind of thing. I complained last time, where are the monsters? You know, like where are the monsters? Like there's, there's like a zombie, there's a goblin, like, and there's a dwarf, like a drunk dwarf, like where are the rest of the monsters? Right. But now here they are. (laughs) Right. And they're, they are, there are a lot of them. They are fucking terrifying. And, and what it, and, and it feels to me like what they were really doing with the module is like kind of lulling the party into this, like, particular state of mind and then just like wrecking it yeah uh, well it it is also a payoff that you've had these if you've been running as written which is tempting not to do but you should do like you've had these rumors about mutants and strange bodies down river from the castle you've been past the castle probably two or three times already and kind of looked at it and gone that place looks scary let's not go there and of course you've been following the trail of dagmar von wittgenstein and his journey a century earlier so you've kind of had this going on and it's a it's a bit like the breakdown in a funk track. Like you can't just like only listen to that bit and enjoy it. You've got to kind of earn your funk by listening to the couple of verses before then, and then it's good. Then it's the best thing. But um, but you're right. This is this is where it all really ties together and gets good. And my players said that as well. I polled them a bit for their favorite things. Universally, it was like everything in the castle is their favorite thing. Um, and actually, the castle itself. I want to talk about that. Right. The the layout of this thing. The fact that it comes with a huge poster map of it that you can explore. It's really cool. It's like it's 
exaggeratedly gothic. It's perched on these towering cliffs. You've got to cross two ravines to get into the inner bailey if you come from, from the front gate. But it is in a way that is it's awe-inspiring and impractical, a bit like uh, the German castles. There's Burg Eltz, which is actually a proper practical castle because it sits out in the middle of a river. And But then in later years, in the 19th century, you've got those romantic castle romantic architecture ones where people were deliberately designing fairy tale castles like uh, Schloss uh, Hohenzollern and uh, Neuschwanstein and and it's like it's like them basically it looks amazing and impregnable and of course we learn it's not it's there are several ways to get in as well that's the other great thing you can go at the front there's a, a secret way the outlaws can show you you can just get drugged and wake up in the dungeon uh, or you can sort of do both go in through the front and then get drugged and wake up in the dungeon if you are our party of PCs. Uh, it's just really good. Everything links to other rooms and levels in interesting ways. Uh, just a great bit of uh, adventure location design. I love it. Is there anything else you want to say before we move on? Uh, yeah, I just want to quickly run through some of my players' greatest hits to mention. Um, so they like the, they also like the ghouls, the corpse robbers. They liked yeah the fact there were different ways to go in uh, the dinner scene and the taxidermy room in the castle. Oh man, yeah. Basically, they just kind of looked in and went, "No, nah, we're not going in there." But it's still good. It's this room where one of one of the younger sons doesn't really have any mutations, but he is insane, and he just kind of kills people and animals or monsters and and stuffs them in a lifelike way. And when they open the door to his chamber, it's they just see all these eyes of stuffed creatures looking back at them, and he's in there just holding perfectly still. <laughs> right. It's like yeah. a surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, yeah. But I mean, and they were kind of looked at all this and just all of their instincts kicked in correctly and they went, Yeah, uh, nope. no, forget it, closed the door again and went away. Uh but it was uh it's still pretty memorable, clearly. And yeah, and one thing that uh Paul in my group mentioned is that he liked how the castle actually affects the village. It's not two separate locations. Everything in the village is kind of either looking towards, you know, when's Lady Margarita visiting next. What is she providing to us? Or it's some, like the outlaws or people like that, and it's sort of focused against her and her guards. It's more like two halves of one place than it is two separate locations. Yeah, and we haven't actually like said the kind of like basic thing that's going on, really, which might be helpful here, which is the big picture basic thing is that there's this warp stone that was found a long time ago by an ancestor of the Wittgenstein family. And this warp stone is like pure chaos, and it's And what's going on is it's kind of leaching out into the world and causing all these mutations. But also, Lady Marguerite, who's really into necromancy, she has been taking powder from the warp stone and using it, uh, along with this Dr. Jean Rousseau, they've been basically doing like the Tuskegee experiment on these villagers, right? Where, Where they're all sick and they're giving them this like this liquor, this medicinal liquor, this allegedly medicinal liquor that's actually laced with the, <laughs> with the warp stone to see like what happens. Right. And, um, I don't think Jean Rousseau knows that, but he's the one giving it to the villagers. Right. I don't know. I think, I think, I think he does as well. I think he's on the, the bad guy side. Oh, you, oh, you mean he doesn't know the, the, about the chaos of it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. He, I don't think he knows. I don't think he actually knows about that part of it, but I think even if he did know, he's so in love with Lady Marguerite that he would probably still do it. So, yeah, um, but anyway, that, that's kind of what's going on. It's like this. It's like Lady Marguerite is kind of experimenting on the villagers, right? Um, and she also occasionally captures them to do like in-person direct experiments and, and various things. Yeah. Uh, it's quite. It's all quite awful. Before we go, I do have to mention one last thing that we liked, which is the greatest role-playing game illustration of all time, which goes with the encounter of three pints and three straws. And this doesn't look like anything on the face of it, but let's give you the backstory. Ever since they've arrived in the village, these guards have been walking around the place in plate armor. They never reveal their faces and they smell like rotting corpses because that's kind of what they are, right? And so this is a big a mystery thing. And then at some point, three guards come into the tavern where the PCs are, push people around a bit and then order three drinks. And one of our players literally said, oh, we're going to find out what they look like because they've got to raise their visors. But no, I'd already screen capped the illustration that comes with this. <laughs> it shows you three guards with kind of face plates on the classic knights in armor helmets, and they've brought straws with them so they can drink through their visors. <laughs> right. And yeah. it's uh, brilliant. It's they good. actually yeah, commissioned good. that artwork and put it in there. It's amazing. It's good. It's also it's almost like we anticipated that, right? Which is pretty amazing. Okay, so that's in a weird way, that's kind of the segue to questions we had. I just had one. My my lone question on page 48. Mm-hmm. Is that guy supposed to not have a face on page 48? Yeah, I'm just flipping to it now. Yeah, uh, he's uh, I think he's supposed to be an eyeless mutant. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's I saw that and I was like that's either just a 
PDF copying mistake, or that's fucking terrifying. It's one or the other. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the latter. Yeah, yeah. He's like a, a weird mutant guy. Yeah. Fantastic. What are your questions? Okay, so uh, I just had a couple from uh, one of my players, uh, Claytonian, in fact, uh, author of Wizardarium uh, for DCC. I mean, I had answers for this at the time, but I wonder if uh, maybe I was being too kind to the module. And he was saying, like, how did the community of Wittgendorf survive so long on mutant chickens and failing crops and so on? Now, my answer to this was it just had happened gradually enough that people just kind of lived with it and it was on the verge of collapse. Um, But, I mean, does... Did it read that way to you, or do you think it is... Like, well, and they also bit... started eating bodies at a certain point. Mm, there's that as well, yeah. So, I mean, like, they had their they had nutritional value in their systems, just maybe things we wouldn't want to eat, right? I suppose it's true that it is not sustainable in the long term, but maybe I'd given the impression that it was it had been like this for a long time, whereas what we're actually seeing is the tail end of a, a decline. It, it felt like... To, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like this is the last... This is the end. Like, they... Yeah, that's what it felt like to me. And another question that uh, also from the group was, I think, referring to earlier in the adventure, but also here, actually, which is, why do the notes and letters give away so much? They seem to be very incriminating. They're not they encoded. Are, yeah. And, and my answer to this was, I think, I don't know, I think that's just kind of a thing from real history. There's lots of scandals, like the affair of the, the necklace in France, where people get caught with letters that are inappropriate. And it's, I don't know. Am I, again, am I being too generous? I've seen enough period movies to know that it's always a letter that <laughs> that like does the deed, right? right? I mean, it's always a letter that ruins someone or is the the you know the 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 gun on the mantle, right? I mean, um, it makes sense though, right? Like in that time period, you don't have as many opportunities to communicate with people, and in a and in certainly not in a timely manner. And so, if you're going to write a letter, which might take weeks to get to someone, you're going to make sure there's no ambiguity, right? Because I guess so, yeah. Also, not that many people can read in the Warhammer setting. So there's that too. Yeah, yeah. Well, historically as well. So yeah. yeah, fair enough. Fantastic. Let's move on to the chain lightning round. Tom, there's a quote in the text for the Chamber of Ingrid von Wittgenstein that says this: "Whatever you think could make a cat strange, at least one of these cats will look like that." Ludwig did not start as a cockroach. Uh, He mutated into a cockroach. And there is a foreshadowing of his mutation um, in a portrait of him as a child, where we kind of see some elements of the mutation kind of kicking in. And uh, it's brilliant. It's so good. There is a beggar in the outer bailey of the castle who obsessively treasures a potato that Lady Margarita threw at him several weeks earlier. The Hall of Whispers is really creepy uh i just i love it so good go read it uh my last one is lady margarita's corpse strewn bedroom it like really ramps up the tension before the players pass through there into the sorceress tower which is where her experiment area is like all the other rooms in the keep have been quite active you know there are people in there they can interact with or things that is just weird or, or, or attacks them in some way but here it's just quiet there's just dead bodies under the bed and in the chairs and maybe over there by the armoire. Finally, there is a golem like character called Brutog, and you might encounter him, uh, his face smiling at you from the ceiling. Let's go to the expert delve. It's the expert delve. All right, I see a lot of notes here. What are we talking about, Tom? So, yeah, first of all, um, I think I messed up a bit describing Wittgendorf, and I would encourage the GM to get players to ask questions about stuff that doesn't seem to make sense, like, how are all these beggars surviving? And it's, well, it's because they're getting this allegedly medicinal booze from the doctor, that kind of stuff. I don't think I made that clear. And although you can explain stuff afterwards, if someone's kind of sitting in the session thinking, well, this is dumb at the time, that's kind of ruining their fun. So it's better to sort that out as early as you can. Secondly, okay, there is a thing where it's possible to, if you come into the castle through the getting kidnapped and being thrown in the dungeon route, you can emerge right next to the secret warpstone chamber that triggers the end of the scenario. And the actual text just has you kind of not let the PCs find it, which if you're showing them the map could be a little tricky as well. So a bit I added was simply that in Lady Margaret's library, there is the magical passcode that lets you reveal and suddenly see where that secret doorway is, slightly inspired by the Skyblind Spire, if you remember that. Like it's there, but you magically can't see it until you say the words. I don't know. I think this is legit, even though it's basically doing the same thing as just not letting them find it. <laughs> so that's... Uh, anyway, our group went through the Slanesh Chapel entrance in the end anyway, so it didn't really matter. 
Okay, thirdly, you may have to get creative about, again, this is like trying to use as much content as possible. So I slightly uh, cheated with the Warpstone Chamber so they'd have to explore the castle instead of just immediately going to the end. Um, also, I had Ludwig come outside because I wanted them to meet him. When they didn't go in the taxidermy room, I had to kind of do an ex- <laughs> Actually, I think I said something like, as you slam the door, you hear a heavy, f- a heavy thing bounce softly against it. Much like uh, you might hear if, say, the taxidermied body of one of the household servants had been hung there on a hook. Because, of course, that's what's in there, but they didn't look inside. And I was like, well, you've got to get, got to get some of the flavour in. That's, that's pretty on the nose, but yeah. <laughs> like, that's the thing. I think it's better just to say, oh, here's what you missed, like, than to never let them find out about it, right? So that's, that's my theory anyway. And uh, although, actually, I haven't said that, they didn't go in the charnel pit, they didn't go in the aviary, they didn't go in the weird garden. Those, I felt, were, like, less cool and important. Basically, anything that you think is interesting and grotesque, I would just mention as, as often as possible. My final tip, and this is going to segue into our proper topic for Expert Delve, is I messed up in one of the sessions in Wittgendorf, uh, but I suggest that you do this on purpose. If the PCs suitably impress the Doctor, he will invite them to dine with him and Lady Margrethe at his house. But on the spur of the moment, when I was doing this bit, I couldn't find the right page, you know how it goes. I just had him invite them to dinner at the castle, you know. Oh, yes, I'm sure I can arrange an invitation. And then, <laughs> right, yeah. and that's what I ended up doing. So they ate in the main dining hall. They went up in a carriage. They got taken through by the scary guards across the, the thing. So they got right into the inner bailey. They didn't have to assault the castle with a bunch of outlaws. And that worked really well. And it enables you to have a place where you can uh, see all of the surrounding stuff. Like, not close up. You can't investigate all the rooms. But you get a, a good preview of what you're going to see and potentially to meet the villain in a kind of non-confrontational uh, situation again and have that very awkward conversation about you know what you're doing here and try not to say the wrong thing and get yourself um, killed. So I recommend doing that on purpose instead of accidentally like I did it. Well, and that's what happened to Jonathan Harker, right? I mean, exactly right yeah like he got invited to dinner with dracula right and we get to meet dracula in the first 10 minutes right i mean the topic is showing the villain early right and like the advantages of showing the villain early and making sure that the player characters don't kill the villain right away or you know that sort of thing all the, all the problems that can occur when you have the villain appear really early in the adventure but also all the uh, all the reasons why you might want to do this and i think that's a really really fantastic topic I think the way you framed it of like, you know, forget the forget the village dinner and just have the dinner take place in the castle uh, to get to get even more of an effect. I think that's a really great way of putting it. I th- I think it's okay to do it in the in the village. To me, yeah, the the characters aren't going to get like to view the castle early, but they still get a scene with this like creepy ass lady Marguerite and her sycophantic, you know, doctor whose face is putrefying behind all of his makeup. Right. I mean, it's still a great moment. Like that moment in the module is so good. And I just remember reading it and thinking, Oh my God, like I want to do this scene right now. Like this is so good. And the reason why it appealed to me is because I do this all the time. Hell, probably every time in games where where there is a big bad, where there is a main villain. I have the main villain show up really early. Even They frequently even interact with the characters really early. I think it's a very powerful narrative technique. Um, I mean, I guess there's something to be said about like having the, you know, having the villain be like cloaked in mystery or whatever, you know, and, and that you don't reveal them until the end. But But the best villains are villains that have personality, that have something to say, that kind of dominate, you know, the scene, that kind of chew the scenery. And and so and you want to get them in there, right? Um, and so I do this quite a lot. And so I have I have some thoughts here, but this is your topic, so I'll let you start. It's kind of a cliche of say uh, screenwriting uh, advice and so on or whatever, that it's it's good writing to have the hero of your adventure meet the villain very early on in a place where they're not in direct conflict, either because they don't know it's the villain yet. That's a classic one. You know, a bit later, it's you from the palace, you know, um, or because they're in a place where it's impossible to, to turn to violence or to, to arguments. That's why James Bond is forever meeting the bad guy in the first reel in casinos, because, I mean, you, you know, you're only allowed to speak French at the table, let alone pull out your gun and shoot them. And Death on the Right does this with the Pale Lady encounter. When you arrive in Wittgendorf uh, the first time, you're there, but she's surrounded by her guards. The only thing you can do is 
is maybe save a villager and not even the one they came to kidnap. <laughs> like, And actually, it's very important here as well because this is well past the halfway point of your playtime in the adventure. And so far, your big bad has been an entirely different evil sorceress, Atelka Hertzen, who, by the way, I had to go to dinner in the castle as well because, like, she was still kind of hovering around as a loose end, so... And that's that's good, like good for various reasons. You establish the personality of the villain. You let the the hero hate or like them, have a relationship with them in a way. But of course, in role playing games, it's problematic because it can be a bit railroaded. You have this idea like, oh, they have to meet the villain, but they can't actually do anything to them. And you can find yourself in that awkward kind of, oh no, they just happened to have a teleporter device on them or something. Oh no, it was. But uh, I think there are a couple of get out mitigations to this. One is that maybe you don't have to meet them in person straight away. Encountering the villains in a circle, so like their lair or their various lieutenants and so on, that's pretty much the same thing as meeting them in person. At Castle Wittgenstein, when I ran it, they didn't actually get a chance to meet Lady Margrethe because she was late for dinner. So they chatted to Atelka Hertzen very awkwardly because she didn't recognise them. They'd been chasing her around the countryside. She'd never seen them before except kind of in the distance on a boat. So they like they recognised her perfume as soon as she came in, but she was like, oh, hello, what do you do? Uh, there was also a chaos warrior who refused to reveal his face and was also very evasive as to which side he'd been fighting on in the chaos wastes in the north. But because they wouldn't stop eating the poisoned food... <laughs> <laughs> Even when they, they kind of passed out and got taken to the dungeon before Lady Margrethe arrived for dinner. But it was okay because they talked about Lady Margrethe to enough people by now that they knew what to expect when they went to her tower. And then secondly, go Apocalypse World style and look at all your NPCs through crosshairs and, and just don't protect the villain at all. And someone blogged about this a year or two ago, I forget who, on a sort of old school adjacent blog about how you don't need to decide who your main villain is at the beginning. You know, if the bandits ride into town, and their leader gets killed off straight away, or well, their second in command then sort of becomes, you know, crawls away wounded and comes back for revenge. Uh, in Death on the Reich, if the PCs show up, somehow immediately send Lady Margrethe to wizard prison forever. Uh, there's, you know, there's that skeleton guy who's been resurrected and is a bit bored with it in, in the tower in the outer bailey. Or her mom. Or her mom, or any of the, frankly, any of the, <laughs> any of that crew, except for Ludwig, because he's lovely. We, we have to protect Ludwig at all costs. At all costs. But basically, yeah, it, and, and that's arguably even better because now there's a villain who has probably a revenge-based relationship to the PCs because of something they did themselves on screen, not just because their goals are uh, across purposes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I agree with all that. I'll offer just some alternate takes here. I have lately been playing uh, Hearts of Wulin a lot. Um, that is a uh, a game of wuxia melodrama uh, powered by the apocalypse. And one of the things that happens in the wuxia genre is that the hero frequently clashes with the big bad early on and loses, right? And then they don't, they are not able to defeat the big bad until they have their inevitable training montage, right? And in Hearts of Wulin, this convention of the wuxia genre is built directly into the rules, whereby you literally can't defeat the big bad because the big bad is a higher scale than you. Like you cannot, there's no way to mechanically do it. They will always win uh, until you go do your training montage and then and then you have a chance after that. But what I love about it, and what I, and what I love about running Hearts of Wulin is that the villain gets to make an appearance early on. Sometimes they make multiple appearances and they get to, they get to vamp it up. They get to chew the scenery. They get to do whatever they're going to do. And, um, and it's great. And the player's, can't do anything about it right mm -hmm. now that is that works and the players accept that because a it's part of the rules they don't have any choice but also because it's it's a convention of the genre and so pl players kind of expect like this is how this is going to go because i've seen wuxia movies and this is, how, this is how it goes right the interesting question here is could you do something similar in say a fantasy adventure game and i think the answer is undeniably yes i really do I have done this plenty, whereby, for whatever reason, they just can't beat the bad guy this early, <laughs> right? And um, sometimes I get a little heavy, I've gotten a little heavy-handed with it, like, oh, it turns out he's actually an illusion, or, oh, you know, or in a sci-fi game, he's a hologram or something, right? Or um, I've, I've even done the, like, he teleports away thing, I've done that. But the thing is, is I find that the players don't care, because they, they don't expect to be able to beat the bad guy this early, right? And in fact, they don't even want to beat the bad guy this early, because that would be unsatisfying, right? 
Yeah, that's right. And actually, it doesn't have to be a gotcha moment. You could literally say, oh, looks like it's probably just a hologram of this guy. And they'll go, okay, fine. If they know that, then they know it's it's okay. I'll tell you, though, that most of the time I don't do it in that heavy handed way where it's an illusion or he can teleport away or whatever, right? What I normally do is I just set it up so that they just don't have a reason to attack the big bad that early, right? <laughs> um, it could be that the player characters don't even know they're the big bad, right? They don't even know it. Actually, that's really great when the players know it's the main villain, but the player characters don't know it's the main villain. That is a beautiful role-playing game space to occupy because you're getting the appropriate story because the player characters don't have the information, but the players do have the information, and so they get to enjoy it as like participants or as audience participants, right? Uh, that is ideal role-playing to me. And so I usually set it up that way. But yeah, like on measure, I think it's okay if you just make it to where they can't defeat the villain that early. I, I think it's okay. I think one of the difficulties in converting the Hearts of Wulin approach to standard fantasy gaming is that in Hearts of Wulin, although they can't defeat the bad guy early on, equally it's part of the promise that the bad guy won't completely murder the entire player character group in the early thing. And that's in the rules as well. That's true too, yeah. But I think this can be harnessed, whereas like in, in say, D&D, &D, they probably could just, like a dragon could just kill your whole party. They would, they would just do it. But I think there's power in that as well, because we can, we can harness the power of embarrassment and, and frustration, which is like in, uh, let's think about the prologue of Conan the Barbarian, okay? Conan the kid doesn't survive that opening village slaughter because the bad guy is like, oh, you've, you've successfully def you know, defended yourself from me. He just can't be bothered to kill that kid. <laughs> so that's, okay. that's all you need, really, is like the, the, the villain kind of looks at these play characters and goes, yeah, not really worth it. And saunters away. And I think if you want to guarantee anything, we'll uh, uh, drive the player characters towards defeating this guy. That particular oh, yeah. attitude yeah. Will, will do it quite well. You know, another thing I've done to kind of show the villain early is uh, flashbacks. I think flashbacks are really good. So Blood and the Chocolate, I think, has one of the best written main villains of, of any of these modules we've, we've done. And I did flashbacks showing... The player characters interacting with um, I can't remember her name, but uh, Lucia did something was it? Yeah, name? or Lucia, Lucia. Uh, I don't remember. Oh, but, yeah, you know, she was Italian. Yeah, Lucia. Yeah. Yeah, but in any case, I did flashbacks showing the player characters interacting with Lucia in order to get some of those good scenes in. And indeed, <laughs> it was smart that I did that because when they finally encountered her in the dungeon, uh, they just shot her rather unceremoniously. <laughs> I remember we talked about that. Like, how is this How is this great motivation ever going to come out? But yeah, so flashbacks is the answer. Flashbacks yeah. are great, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Those are a few of my techniques. Yeah, definitely get the villain in there early. Don't, don't save them. Like when I run Ravenloft, Strahd appears like right away. <laughs> like I, I have Strahd in there, you know? Uh, well, actually, as, as you sort of mentioned in the notes here, but I'm going to steal, Death on the Reich has a good way of doing this as well, which is that when the player characters first encounter Lady Margrita, they don't realise... It's not that like she's secretly the villain, they think she's someone else. It's not that they can't, couldn't get to her if they tried to and so on. It's they just see this noble beating, having a peasant beaten up. but And this is what reinforces the themes of a general kind of lack of fairness in the Empire. That's not different to anything, any other village they've been in. So they don't know yet they need to worry about this particular noble having a having a peasant beaten. Uh, that's maybe one of the most depressing things in the whole yeah, <laughs> adventure. I know, uh, I yeah. know. It's only later when we find out about the experiments. That's suddenly now they're a bad guy. Suddenly it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say about this, Tom? Um, no, I, I don't think I do. I think just to, to summarize our discussion just now, what are we saying? We want to sh show villains as early as possible. Uh, their sidekicks will do if they absolutely have to. And you've got to use either physical or social constraints to stop them from being completely eliminated in the first scene. Or don't bother and let their vengeful child or best friend or spouse or something become the next villain. Sounds good to me. Let's go to Companion Adventures. It's Companion Adventures. Uh, let's start with films and TV. Um, I'm going to suggest The Road, a movie that I hate intensely, uh, but one that captures the bleakness, or what I imagine the bleakness of Wittgendorf uh, would, would be like. Um, the movie itself is is quite terrible. Uh, I, I've never finished it. <laughs> um, 
Uh, I've read the book as well. I've never finished the book either. Um, I, I think the reason why I've never finished either of them is because they're so oppressively bleak. Like there's a there's a level of bleakness that I can't quite deal with. And the only thing that makes Death on the Reich, this part of Death on the Reich, tolerable for me is the humor. Right? Um, if it were just the like, if it were just a, the steady baseline of bleakness, I would not be able to deal with it. Um, but if you want some good bleak starving people imagery boy the road is a great place to go yeah, yeah i imagine it is uh my tv recommendation is uh the opposite of bleak it's the children's tv show maid marion and her merry men uh written by and kind of starring tony robinson yeah from like ni- early 90s late 80s early 90s and the village where this is set or uh, where the where the peasants live works up on mud. It's basically how I picture uh, Vickendorf. It's well, I mean the name the name says it all. You can find a lot of episodes. I don't know if all of them, but a lot of episodes on YouTube. I've got a music recommendation, and that is the soundtrack to the 1977 film Suspiria. Uh, the soundtrack is uh, kind of an innovative soundtrack for the time uh, by Goblin. I have issues with the movie Suspiria, but I think the soundtrack is really really good it's kind of like exists in this space between like kind of psychedelia and like synth wave. Like it kind of is somewhere in the middle of that. And indeed like temporally it's in the middle of that, but, um, but it feels right to me. Like when I, when I was listening to it uh, the other day in preparation for this, I, I was, I was, I felt, I felt right. I was like, yeah, this feels like, like what it sounds like in my head as we're kind of moving through Wittgendorf and Wittgenstein. Um, I could have gone with the, like a more classic medieval kind of thing, but I don't think that was the right move here. I think the kind of weird psychedelia, uh, synthy quality was is nice here. Uh, for gaming resources, in a way, I'm going to throw out another shout out to the In Character Journal that uh, my player Paul C wrote while we were playing this as his character Johan the ex boatman, with guest entries by a random passing barge captain, which I wrote when Paul was away. And another guest entry by Ludwig von Wittgenstein, which Paul wrote when he came back and fancied writing as a different character for one entry. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, and finally, I've got a book, which is Titus Grown, the first in the Gormenghast trilogy by Mervyn Peake. As a caveat here, uh, I only read the first few chapters when I was a teenager, and then I had to give it back to the school library. And over the years, I never quite got around to reading the whole thing. But the fact that I thought immediately of Castle Gormenghast, this Baroque decaying, um, archaic, ritualized place when I was thinking about Castle von Wittgenstein suggests that probably this is about right for inspiration. Fantastic. And listeners, that's our show. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. If you'd like to get in touch with The Gauntlet, we can be found on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. We have a website. It's gauntlet-rpg.com. You can join our discussions at forums.gauntlet-rpg.com. And we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. One of those Patreon levels allows you to get access to the Gauntlet Slack group, which is kind of a, a more of a private uh, way of all of us hanging out. I would love for Fear of a Black Dragon listeners to get in on that. I feel like the I feel like the balance between story gamers and OSR gamers is a little out of whack in the Slack right now. Um, so perhaps you could help bolster those numbers, listeners. And with that, uh, Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Jason, thank you. And thank you to Luke Quaid our editor and thank you listeners take care